Good afternoon. My name is Ken Lustbader, and I'm one of the co-directors of the NYC LGBT Historic Sites Project. And we are a cultural heritage initiative and educational resource documenting historic LGBT spaces throughout the five boroughs of New York City. I imagine we're a poster child for cultural heritage in New York um, on the heels of this conversation. Uh, we're literally putting LGBT history on the map by looking at it through a rainbow lens. Um, that includes a cultural heritage inventory of sites from the 17th century to the year 2000. Uh, we're also nominating sites to the National Register of Historic Places, creating educational programs, working with the Department of Education, doing classroom presentations, as well as uh, establishing walking tours and other content that we've documented. Again, we're looking at sites that are extant, reflecting the history of the LGBT community, so that could be self-referential, as well as those sites that are um, conveying the influence of a community. So that could be a church, it could be a meeting house, it could be a performance venue, it can be a residence of a notable individual. So we're looking at it really in a broad brush stroke. So given that it's LGBT History Month, I'm gonna start with a pop quiz of sorts. Um, this is the most obvious LGBT example of a site in the country, or if not the world. If you don't know it, it's the historic Stonewall Inn at Christopher Street. In 1969, it was the site of the Stonewall Uprising. Uh, it was a mafia-run bar, and then after a routine raid, the patrons fought back. The local residents converged in over six days in June to July of 1969. Um, people fought back and basically created a key turning point in the LGBT rights movement. And next year is the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall Uprising, and we will be celebrating with the rest of the city who anticipates upwards of four million visitors. So we're hoping to be able to disseminate our information and content. Um, a next slide, you may wonder, what does this have to do with LGBT history? And if someone says, Judy Garland, a gay icon performed here, yes, that's true, but really, it goes back to 1891 when Carnegie Hall was completed. During its opening night performances and opening day performances, Tchaikovsky, who was gay, world renowned, he um, actually conducted some of his own pieces there. And since then, LGBT luminaries have performed there, including the Gay Men's Chorus, who you'll be hearing about, hearing from in a couple of minutes, really. Um, this rather mundane row house in the Bronx was built in, eight, in 1926 by Christian Jorgensen's father. Christian Jorgensen lived there from her birth until she came back from her gender reassignment surgery in 1953. She was swarmed by media at the time and became a household name and really put the word trans on the map at that period of time and from then uh, really was a, a prominent person and, and during that period. This is Bethesda Terrace or Bethesda Fountain. You may wonder, again, what does this have to do? It's an iconic New York City site, um, but Angel of the Waters statue that sits above the fountain was designed in the 1860s by Emma Stebbins, and she lived in Rome at the time with her same-sex partner, Charlotte Cushing, with a group of friends known as the Jolly Bachelors. So that's another layer of LGBT history, as well as it being the uh, backdrop for Tony Kushner's Angels in America, uh, one of the last scenes there. So you could see that we're really trying to capture the diversity of the community itself and the broadness of these sites. Why did we start the project? This is just a smattering of the 150 sites that we've fully documented, if you can go back for a moment. Um, it really just reflects the sort of diversity of sites that we're trying to achieve. When we started the project in 2015, we realized that there was not one single survey of sites associated with LGBT history in New York City. It didn't allow for anyone to have context of how to evaluate these sites. Stonewall was known, but others weren't. So we felt that there were so many sites that were unappreciated or, and unrecognized, and we needed to really put this on the map and convey that LGBT history is American history. So, the most obvious component of our work, thank you, um, is our website. If you go to our website, we have 150 sites fully documented. We have another 300 on a database. <clears throat> Each one is, in a sense, an online exhibition. You could go in and search 
uh, by categories such as bars and clubs, which are the most obvious types, but as I said earlier, we're way beyond the bar. We're looking at medical facilities, community and organizing spaces, and stores and business and, and the like. And then you can go into the map and filter it by cultural significance. And you could see here a smattering of the various cultural, cultural signifiers that we've attached to each of those locations, some of them having multiple, multiple associations. So it's a really robust way to go in, have fun by geography, and really understand, again, I'm stressing the cultural significance of the LGBT community on American and New York City culture. Um, to paraphrase the wonderful Fran Leibowitz, if you took away all the homosexuals and homosexual influence on American culture, you'd be left with less, let's make a deal. So we're really trying to convey that, especially going forward with the pushback of LGBT rights. Um, for those who really don't want to sort of explore by geography, we've created more of a didactic way to go in through curated themes. You could look at the AIDS crisis, activism before Stonewall, influential black New Yorkers and so forth, uh, transgender history. There are really mini tours um, where we've attached sites to those geographies, um, but it's a way to enter and not be overwhelmed by the numerous pins on the map. Um, I think another part of why we started this project is really to increase diversity on the National Register. When we wrote our grant application, there were two sites listed on the National Register of the 92,000, 93,000 sites uh, currently on the register. That's nothing when you think about the influence of the LGBT community on America. There are countless sites that are already listed on the register um, that need to be reinterpreted. We're looking at the Alice Austin House on Staten Island. It was listed on the National Register. Um, in the 70s, but we felt that it needed to be reinterpreted, so we recently amended it to address Alice Austin's 19th century photography, which was in the original nomination, um, but it didn't include her 50-year same-sex relationship with Gertrude Tate, so we recently amended that nomination and are working on others we just finished, or Amanda Davis, who's here, our project manager, she wrote the nomination for Cafe Chino, located on Cornelia Street in Greenwich Village between 1958 and 1968. It was the birthplace of off-Broadway off theater and an incubator space for gay playwrights and um, actors, really significant. Um, Earl Hall, some of you may know this and wonder why is Earl Hall there? Well, it's at Columbia University, 1966 the um, creation of the first uh, student homophile league in the country. Um, soon after, other student organizations related for LGBT rights were formed, including Cornell and others around the country. We put it on the National Register last year, and Columbia um, and Earl Hall is also known to many for its gay dances on Friday nights going forward. We're also advocating for uh, future landmarking and for evaluations of potential landmarks in the city. This is the Walt Whitman House on Ryerson Street in Brooklyn. Um, this is a house that was, um, Walt Whitman lived here from 1855 to 1856. It's where um, he was living when Leaves of Grass was published in nearby Brooklyn Heights. It's also where Ralph Waldo Emerson came down to meet him, to congratulate him on the publication in December of 1855. But this raises all the issues that were touched on earlier about cultural landmarking and cultural heritage and documentation. Here you're looking at something that is not necessarily an architectural pedigree that one would designate it for that. Um, it's also been altered. In the 1890s, the third roof, the third floor was added. It's been sided. So the issues that we're confronting are not only documentation, but how do you deal with, say, for example, on the National Register, issues of integrity and how do you put that cultural heritage um, forward when it's not architecturally based? So there are a number of challenges that we're confronting as a project. Um, we're not dealing with architectural character, but more of historic and cultural. Documentation is really difficult with these cases, especially with LGBT historic sites. LGBT history, LGBT place-based history is really recent, only dating from the 1990s. Um, the documentation is really challenging. Uh, many organizations moved over time, had, were transient, were underground, their own record keeping wasn't that great, so the record is really difficult to uncover. Um, oftentimes family members threw out documents because they were 
uh, didn't think they were of value or didn't want the person to be exposed as gay. So those are some of the issues that we're dealing with, let alone the idea that many stakeholders or agencies may not have the expertise in LGBT history on how to evaluate it and put it in context into a broader way. Um, I think the other issue that often comes up is the burden of proof. Um, changing terminology over time, concepts of gender, sexuality. Homosexuality wasn't a term that wasn't even coined until the mid to late 19th century. Um, uh, Alice Austin wouldn't consider herself a lesbian. It wasn't a term used then, so we have to use same sex. So the burden of proof is often higher for LGBT people than for normal documentation purposes. I think another issue in New York State that's challenging for us in terms of cultural sites is that um, the state register requires that we look at the, a building related to cultural heritage um, architecturally on the outside and on the interior for integrity. So many buildings, as you know, in New York City have been altered. So the issue of architectural integrity is really challenging. Does it look like the period of significance um, that the person would recognize, such as Cafe Chino, what did it look like then, what does it look like now as a restaurant? And then lastly, we need to get owner consent, which is very challenging in New York, even though the National Register is not regulatory, with the exception of using federal or state funds. So those are some of the challenges we're confronting, but on a happier note, we're really m pushing forward with our project. This is a map we did for the National Parks Conservation Association of sites around the Stonewall Inn, reflecting pre and post Stonewall history and LGBT history in the village. Um, this Sunday, we're doing another one of our Greenwood tours, going to Greenwood Cemetery to put LGBT pride flags on the site of um, LGBT individuals who are buried there. We do events such as this one at Julius's Bar in Greenwich Village to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Sippin, which was a monumental public act of resistance about uh, the state liquor authorities' oppressive controls in the 60s. And then, we have social media, which is a really important component for any historic preservation project to get the word out. In the past, one would only have to um, sort of do these reports, put them on the shelf, and now we have the ability to convey this to a whole other audience and have a different level of engagement. So if you are thinking about tangible trail that we're creating, we're also really at the intersection of LGBT history, historic preservation, and social justice. We're in creating an intangible benefit of pride, community, and continuity, and identity. So please follow us on Instagram, and thank you for having me.